your host, Sean Lynn, in the pub for a dram with friends where we talk about faith, family, food, and fun. Pull up a chair and I'll pour you a drink. Episode 47. We welcome scripture scholar Dr. Michael Barber into the pub. Sit back as I pour us a dram. I hope you're enjoying a dram with friends. Please like, subscribe, follow us on Heroic Men YouTube or your favorite podcast platform. Please continue to pray for our mission or go to godsquad.ca to donate. All whiskeys are purchased by myself for use in the pub. Thank you as we continue with our episode. Welcome to another episode of A Dram with Friends. We are extremely blessed to welcome Dr. Michael Barber from the Augustine Institute into the pub. Welcome. Thanks so much for having me here. So, I understand you're a Diet Coke guy, so I thought I'd go with the, <laughs> the rum today. I got an El Dorado eight-year-old that I wanted to try, so uh, uh, welcome. Thanks, Thanks so, so much, much for having, having me. me. It's, great it's great to be with, with you. you. So for our, our friends in the pub, uh, who is Dr. Michael Barber? Well, I'm a professor at the Augustine Institute Graduate School of Theology here in Greenwood Village, Colorado, which is just outside of Denver. Um, I, uh, I I love scripture study. I'm the husband of Kimberly and the father of six beautiful kids, ages wow. four through 13. And uh, um, ever since I was a young teenager, I knew I wanted to be a professor and teach scripture. So I've just sort of been on that track uh, since I was pretty young. And uh, I think I have the best job in the world, and I'm really grateful that I get to do what I do. Well, I can think of worse places to teach as well. That Denver area is beautiful. I've been down there a couple times. In fact, I camped in front of Tim Gray's house uh, 10 years ago, 11 years ago, I guess it is now. And, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's beautiful down there. Yeah, Tim Gray is a dear friend of mine. And it is an incredible blessing to, to work with him and then so many other uh, great scholars that we have here at the Graduate School, uh, Mark Gieschek, Brant Petrie, uh, John Seahorn, Elizabeth Klein, many others. It's, it's really an amazing place to be. Yeah, friends of mine uh, moved down from Calgary to Denver and they, they feel like they've moved to the Catholic utopia of... Uh, <laughs> So the Catholic community in Denver is like nothing I've ever experienced in my life. It's an incredible diocese. Uh, we have very full churches. Uh, confession is available pretty much any day of the week. You can always find confession in the morning, in the afternoon. You know, many dioceses I've lived in, really, if you wanted to go to confession, your only option was like a Saturday. But uh, it's, a, it's a, just a very different story here. There's so many things happening, so many great apostolates. And in many ways, people trace it back to John Paul II's vi famous visit here for World Youth Day. It seems like the ripples of that event are, are still being felt. It's, it's uh, amazing. It, and it's amazing how many priests I've talked to that that was the moment that they realized that they were called to the priesthood by attending that, that right. uh, World Youth Day and and many others, uh, we we took our children to World Youth Day in 2002, which was extremely memorable. It was the last one Pope John Paul II was at, and it's uh, right. it's it's funny how little th well, it wasn't a little thing, but how an event like that can start an avalanche as it were, because Denver is an abundance of riches when it comes to the Catholic faith there. 
And, right, right, and we have great, great Catholic history. For example, Mother Cabrini was here, and there's the Mother Cabrini Shrine, for example. So even aside from World Youth Day, there's some great Catholic history here. And God has been very good to Denver. Well, and, and there's lots of great Catholic history in both our countries. Uh, uh, if you've been up north of the border, the churches in Montreal and Quebec City, it, it's just fascinating the history unfortunately at the time of this recording we're struggling in canada because Mm. the media is painting that history in a very dark manner and the churches here are are suffering with Mm. vandalism Uh, i think we've had half a dozen churches burned to the ground in canada Mm. so uh it's it's important that people. Well, I was going to say the Catholic Church is on fire here in Denver, but I meant that in a positive way. So, so yeah, well, and that's what we're hoping to do here in Canada, in Calgary. We're very blessed, even though the churches have been attacked here in Calgary. We we're, we're very blessed to have some some great young dynamic priests, mm-hmm. uh, very very good diocese. North of us in Edmonton, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of the Family Life Conference up there. Unfortunately, we haven't had it for the last two years, but it's it's kind of like a Catholic Woodstock where mm-hmm. you have all these Catholic families come, and we we've had as great guitar many- solos. What's that? Lots, Lots of great guitar, guitar solos. Oh, there, there's some of that. Uh, oh, okay, all right. Father Stan Fortuna was doing that one year, and uh, oh, okay, and uh, yeah, we've had great speakers over the years and it's it's just a big field that everybody camps in whether it's tents or trailers or mm. it, and they make these little so creating those communities how coming out of covid are we going to re rekindle those communities throughout both nations and around the world is cuz that's what i'm seeing we, we were locked down a lot more than you down there, but trying to get the butts back in the seat, as it were. Mm. Well, for me, one of the most important things to talk about is, is salvation. So I've written a book called Salvation, What Every Catholic Should Know. And I really feel like that's at the crux of the gospel, right? What, what do I have to do to be saved? The rich young man says to Jesus. And it's sort of a, a weird situation to find ourselves in that uh, in, in, in the creed, for example, if you go to Mass on Sunday, uh, you'll hear that the entire reason Jesus came down from heaven, the whole point of the incarnation was for us men and for our salvation. And yet we as Catholics, we don't talk about salvation. We have these wonderful euphemisms like going to heaven or something like that, which I think are really problematic because and, 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 and almost dangerous, right? Because when you think of the goal of your life is simply going to heaven, well then what you're subconsciously doing is you're you're putting off the gospel. Well, yeah, and that's for when I go to heaven. That's after I die, that you know, that's not the way the New Testament talks. The New Testament doesn't talk about it really doesn't talk about going to heaven. It talks about what do I have to do to be saved? And so we have this really weird situation where we talk about salvation being central in the creed. Again, it's the whole point of the incarnation. Why did Jesus come down from heaven? Why was he born at Christmas? For our salvation. Why did Jesus die on the cross? For our salvation. Why did he rise from the dead? For our salvation. It's all for our salvation. But then, you know, if you were to go after Mass... Immediately after saying those words uh, to the parish hall, let's say they have the uh, eighth sacrament of coffee and donuts after mass. Yeah, we're all familiar with that. If, if you were to go to the hall after mass and you were standing in line waiting for your coffee and donut, and you heard somebody talking about how he wants to be saved, how he's being saved, how the gospel is the power of salvation, how Jesus is his Lord and Savior, I think a lot of Catholics would just imagine that that person talking that way in line was a non-Catholic visitor to the parish. Because we Catholics, we never talk about being saved or salvation. And I think that's really at the heart of the crisis we see 
in the church today is we, we get very preoccupied with these peripheral issues of whatever you want to fill in the blank. And, and we forget that at the heart of the gospel message, the heart of the creed is the issue of being saved. Well, and and so I think we need to talk more about that. I think that's really at the heart of the crisis in the church today. Well, and yeah, I, I totally believe that that is the problem. It, it, the, this lie that I'm a good person, I'm going to heaven, uh, it, it's almost like the spirit in the sky. I got a friend in Jesus, and right. uh, uh, I've never sinned. So wasn't that at Woodstock? I don't. Yeah, remember. I don't know when he sang that, but yeah, yeah. It, Norman Greenbaum. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, and you, you listen to that, and you're going, "That's such a lie!" Like I've never sinned. Like I got a friend in Jesus. Well, that was the whole reason Jesus came is because we sinned right, and we right. need to, as Paul say, work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Like that doesn't sound like, Oh, I'm okay. Uh, you know, I went to got my sacraments. I'm good. Right. Like, right. Well, I mean, that's a, a, at the heart of it, right? One of the issues that, so in my book, salvation, whatever Catholics, you know, what I try to do is I, highlight the, the various misconceptions people have about salvation, right? So the the beginning of the book is, what is salvation? And then the following chapters are all, what it's not, right? So yeah. one of the lies out there is salvation is inevitable. Now, well, you know, everybody's going to go to heaven. Uh, everybody's going to be saved. And, of course, being saved is not just going to heaven. Yeah. <laughs> I really want to underscore that. It's not just about going to heaven. It's about being changed in this life. And I think a lot of people just imagine that um, they're going to be okay. I'm okay. You're okay. Everything's fine. Uh, the reality is our lives are not fine, and we're broken, and we struggle, and we need to repent. And if we don't acknowledge that we need to be saved, uh, then we won't be because we think we're doing fine on our own, and uh, we won't recognize the need for Jesus' power in our lives. So it's, it, it's interesting you how to approach that subject because yeah. i think part of the problem is we we've, we've got a bad rep for that oh you're a sinner and you're no good you know like that invitation versus that accusation so right i think it's important not to be accusatory because of course we're all sinners and uh, one of the key lies is that salvation is for everybody else <laughs> I don't need salvation. I'm really against sin. Uh, I'm really against all the problems in our society, which are committed by everybody other than me. Right. Yeah. Um, and so I, I don't want to accuse anybody. I just like to talk about what, what the Lord has done for me in my own life, you know, and that, um, I mean, not to get into like graphic details or anything, but just to say that I recognize that I am broken, that I'm a sinner and that I need to, not just say, oh, I make mistakes. I don't make mistakes. I sin. I know things are wrong, and I know certain things are wrong, and I do it anyway, and that's a problem, and it makes me miserable. And the great gift of the gospel, the good news, is that I don't have to be miserable due to my sin, uh, that I can really find joy in salvation and the joy of Christ. And so I, I think talking about how Christ has changed us and how what Christ has meant for us, uh, meant to us, uh, is really, really important. So you're personalizing it. You're you're making it about what Christ has done for you and that invitation that he can do that for you. Right. In, rather than that accusatory, right. you're, you're a sinner and you need to repent. So Right. The main, the main thing that I would say is, I, I think most people understand this. Uh, I I want to love and to be loved. And uh, sometimes I've been uh, brought to great disappointment when people who I love haven't loved me in ways that I expected them to love me. Or uh, I have been disappointed in myself for not loving in the ways that I want to. I've let people down. And I am ashamed and, and regret that. 
But the great news of the gospel is that I can learn to love in ways that are truly supernatural because of the gift of Christ, because of his grace. And I think that's something that everybody can relate to and understand, right? That uh, well, it's Especially men that struggle with feelings of inadequacy or they, they're not doing it right or they're not being valued in their role or sure. just understanding that they are loved and mm-hmm. they do make mistakes. And, and right. I, I use the, I don't know if you remember the Bob Carlyle song, the saints are the sinners that fall down and get back up again. Mm-hmm. And just use that, that line that we all fall short. It's just what we do with that. And that, that, ready for the battle. Uh, it was well, I think a lot, a lot of Catholics, Catholics actually, actually fall into a kind of despair because they actually do believe that salvation is something that I do, that salvation is really something that is on me, so to speak. Um, that, in other words, um, we have to convince God that we're lovable. I remember when I was a college professor, uh, now I just teach graduate students at the Augustine Institute, but when I taught undergraduate students, there was a a young woman who came to set up an appointment with me after a class. I thought she had a question about the the final paper that was coming up, the term paper that was coming up, or maybe the final exam. She was from a devout Catholic family, uh, and she was very involved in her parish, at least in various outreach programs they had to the homeless. She came to my office and it became very apparent that that was not what she wanted. And she didn't want to talk about the mechanics of the class. She basically told me, I'm not buying what you're selling. And what you're selling is that God loves us no matter what. And I know that God does not love me because I've done all these horrible things. I'm just trying to convince him that, that, that I can be better and that I can be worthy of his love. I mean, I had to sit down and just read her the prodigal son story, which she heard a thousand times, yeah. but never really understood, right? That it doesn't matter what you do. There's nothing that you can do that will make God stop loving you. Right? I mean, there's nothing you can do to convince God that you're unlovable. And, and I think a lot of Catholics feel that way. I think a lot of Catholics feel shame over their past, not just Catholics, people in general, yeah. feel shame over their past and, they, they develop feelings of animosity towards religion, towards the Lord, because towards, towards Jesus, be, because somewhere deep down they're convinced that they've disqualified themselves from his love, and nothing could be further from the truth. And so, you know, we really need to emphasize what Paul emphasizes, and that is God loves us even when we're enemies of God. He sent Christ to die on the cross for us, right? So... I think that's a really important message to, to proclaim and to continue to witness to. Absolutely. And I, yeah. I can't agree more that we need to get that message out, let right. people know that they are loved and lovable. Right. And as men and fathers, especially like you said, you have six children. Right. That's where it's so important to sure. have that fatherly image of a loving father because right. and you know you don't have to celebrate everything they do like they get a ribbon for brushing their teeth but they're just know that they are loved and right. i mean and the other side of that is that there are people who on the other side of the, of the pendulum the spectrum yeah. so to speak uh they'll say that well no god loves you so much that you really don't need to repent yeah. Right. That yeah, you know, it, the, they'll even say things like, you know, the gospel is really hard. Uh, the church's teaching, Jesus's teaching, is really hard. The church's teaching on marriage, on sexuality, for example, is really difficult. And so, you know, what we need to do is um, you know, be more realistic, and we need to basically water down the church's teaching. We need to revise it. We need to make it more acceptable to a modern age. Something like that. And that also misses a key aspect of salvation, and that is God loves us just the way we are, but his grace is powerful enough to change us, right? And his love is not contingent on 
on us being different. God loves us just the way we are, but he also loves us too much to let us stay that way. And so, you know, I always like to highlight the story of the rich young man who comes to Jesus, what do I have to do to be saved? And then um, Jesus tells him what he has to do, and the disciples marvel at it. And they come back and they say to Jesus, who then can be saved? And, and Jesus says, with God, he says, with man, it is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Right? With man, this is impossible. And so I think sometimes there's a, an attempt to want to water down that aspect of the gospel. Maybe not to downplay that God loves us, but on the other side of things say, well, you know, what God asks of us isn't really much. It's, you know, we just, have to, we just have to have good feelings towards God, or we have to have nice feelings towards other people. So, no, what God is asking of us is humanly impossible, but the reality is, by his grace, we can be transformed to become like him. So we don't want to play down the power of grace to transform us and to change us uh, for the better. So we don't have to despair of our sin um, because God is able, to, God is more powerful than our sin. Do we really believe that? That's, that's where faith comes in, right? That's where trust comes in. And that's awesome. So yeah. as a father of six, uh, is there a, a dish that you prepare for the family that's the go-to favorite? Or, or... A dish? <laughs> uh, Sean, um, I am such a bad cook that uh, I can't boil water without burning it. Uh, I'm terrible in, in, in the kitchen. I can heat up Hot Pockets. Uh, I've, I one time heated up a, a pizza, but... Um, no, I'm I'm pretty I'm pretty helpless in the kitchen. My kids are astonishingly good cooks. Uh, I have a 13 year old boy who will make mozzarella cheese balls for you like you have never had in your life. They're astonishing. So they have quite a bit to teach me about about cooking. There you go. So yeah. it sounds like you need your 14 year old to to help show you a few recipes and. Uh do some father son time in the kitchen. Oh, I, 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 I like to think that I have, um, I'll, you know, things to teach my kids, but I know that they have things to teach me as well. And it's really beautiful when they get to that age where, you know, they, they really are able to show you new things and to, um, surprise you. My oldest grandson, uh, he's gotten into the cooking and I, We've got our trailer out at their property in BC, and so I got a, a nice uh, kettle cooker barbecue that he's quite oh, excited yeah. to to use and experiment with. So, uh, so one of the segments I, I do is, as you know, a lot of young men are struggling today in today's world, even knowing what a man is. Uh, what advice do you give your eighteen-year-old self? Yeah, I mean, the, the number one thing that I like to emphasize is that a, a lot of people in the Catholic world want to talk about male spirituality or something like that. And it often turns into a discussion of like culture war type stuff, where it often becomes about how the world is your enemy and how other people are your biggest problem. And, you know, or even, you know, well, people will do all these things I think that are very, very unhelpful. Um, the Catechism of the Catholic Church is a beautiful section called the Battle of Prayer. And in that section, it, it, it tells you who our number one opponents are. It's the devil and it's ourselves, right? The number one opponent that you have, that you have really power over in a certain sense, is yourself, right? Um, you're, at, you're at battle with the seven capital sins that are somewhere lurking in your soul and in your spiritual life. And so it is really foolish. I would frequently tell my children this. It's really foolish to blame other people for your sinfulness. It's really foolish to uh, look for ways you can shift the responsibility of good conduct of your you know, uh, need to pursue a virtuous and prayerful life it's, it's really foolish to try to find other people to blame that on. It's the TV. It's the culture. It's the... No. It's you, right? Be a man. Face your own sin. And, and, and learn to um, come to grips with your own mistakes. And I, I hate calling them mistakes. 
your own sins, right? And the other thing that I'd say is you can't do this apart from God's grace. So the number one thing you need to do is to turn to him for help. And so I try to model this for my kids, and I, you know, I often fail because I'm a sinner, but you, know, you, you tell your kids to do X, Y, or Z, and they don't do it. And you're like, didn't I tell you to be nicer to your sibling? Didn't I tell you? Did, didn't I tell you to clean up your closet last weekend? You didn't do it. And you can very quickly fall into um, the heresy of Pelagianism. Pelagianism uh, is named after a heretic named Pelagius who believed you could save yourself. Right? You don't need God's grace. And so what I've learned to do with my kids is whenever they, they, they fail, I sit them down and I ask them, the first question I say is, did you pray today? Did you ask God to help you this morning? Did you ask God to help you remember to do this thing that you were supposed to do? Did you ask God for help in um, responding better to a difficult you know, situation? Okay, well, that's your first mistake, right? Because... We do this all the time, you know, it's all the things that I need to do, and we forget that we need to rely on the Lord. So if we're not spending time every day in prayer, if we're not setting aside, you know, the, the church fathers would say, the doctors would say, 20, 30, 45 minutes a day of mental prayer, when we're not just talking at God, but meditating on the scriptures, asking him to speak to us, if we're not doing that, then you are going to fail. It's not a question of if, it's just a question of when. Uh, because you can't do this apart from his grace. Jesus says in the Gospel of John, um, uh, apart from me, you can do only a few good things. So he doesn't say that. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So if we really believe that, then we need to be turning to him every day in prayer and relying on the grace that is there for us in our prayer life and in the sacraments. Otherwise, we shouldn't expect anything other than utter failure. <laughs> from ourselves. Well, to really be a man, you need to recognize that you need help. You need God's help, and you need to confront your own sinfulness and take responsibility for it and repent. And I, I use, obviously not in spiritual terms or whatever, as a police officer, but when I'm dealing with situations and and conflicts, and as it were, you, you tell the pe- person, Who's the only one that you can change in this dynamic? That's You're right. not going to change the other person. You're not going to change the way they, the only one you can change is yourself and how you react to different yeah. situations. So that's right. It's, it's, an- and you can't do that apart from God's help. So and- you can have all the best intentions. You can make all the greatest resolutions in the world, but if you're not in daily prayer, and and not just, you know, rattling off our fathers and Hail Marys, but, I mean, really meditating on the scriptures in a prayerful way, allowing him to speak to you. Prayer can't just be talking at God, right? It has to involve listening. So if you're not taking time every day to listen to the Lord and to have a real dialogue with him in prayer, then you might as well just hang up your spiritual spikes now because it's over. Right? You, you are definitely going to fail. It's not about, you know, being really determined. That's not going to do it. <laughs> That's where it's so exciting to see the success of Father Mike Schmidt's Bible in a year and people just getting into Scripture and getting into that habit. And uh, that brings us to our next segment. Uh, Jeff Cavins, who developed the Great Adventure Bible Timeline, mm-hmm. he talks about riding with your posse, so your go-to saints. Who, are, who, who would be your go-to saints? Well, um, my confirmation name is Stephen. Uh, I, I have a great devotion to uh, the first martyr. We read about him in the book of Acts. Uh, he was a remarkable young man. It seems he was not particularly mature, uh, at least not in terms of biological development. Spiritually, it's another story. Uh, we read that he was a man of grace and wisdom. We know that he was... Uh, able to refute those in the synagogues who uh, spoke against Jesus. And then most astonishingly, as he's being stoned to death, he prays as Jesus did, Lord, do not hold this sin against them, as Jesus said on the cross in in the Gospel of Luke, Father, forgive them. And St. Augustine said that had Stephen not prayed those words, the church would not have been given the grace of the conversion of St. Paul. Because it says right after Stephen says those words, do not hold this in against them, 
says that the men who stoned stone Stephen left their cloaks at the feet of Saul, who becomes Paul. So the only person named in the martyrdom of Stephen is, is Paul. So my number two go-to saint is St. Paul, wow. uh, who is the greatest missionary in the history of the church. But the only reason the church received the grace of St. Paul was because of the, uh, according to St. Augustine, the dying request of St. Stephen. Um, so it's only through suffering that we're going to bring about evangelization. It's only through suffering that we're going to be able to uh, enter into the mystery of, of Christ fully. And Stephen learns that, and Paul learns that. And so, I mean, those would be my number one and, and, and number two saints that I'd turn to. Well, thank, thank you so much for sharing that with us. Sure. And, uh, their inspirations, it's great learning about all the different saints. And uh, mm -hmm. I think our one of my board members, Deacon Stephen Robinson, he went down there to to do a degree at the Augustine Institute. So I'm sure he'd uh, <laughs> agree with uh, St. Stephen. Uh, so the term whiskey comes from a Gaelic term called Ishkabaha, which means water of life. And uh, I want to thank you for joining us. And I pray that your work continues to lead many souls to the true water of life. And thank you again for joining us in the pub today. Thanks so much for having me. God bless you, Sean. And, oh, joke, cancel. I was supposed to stop recording. I hope you have enjoyed this episode of A Dram with Friends. Like and subscribe. Go to all podcast platforms to look for it on podcast or go to godsquad.ca to support our mission.